Introduction Let us understand the concept of equilibrium with a simple analogy. We have a bucket here filled with some amount of water. It has a tap attached to it as an outlet, and another tap opens into it. Now, if we open both the taps simultaneously, and if the water flows at the same rate from both the taps, then the level in the bucket will never change. Here, water is being poured into the bucket, and water is also being let out of the bucket. But the level of water is constant. We can say that the flow rates of the two taps are in equilibrium with each other. Let us take another example. Let us take some water in a closed container. Now, when water evaporates, the molecules with relatively higher kinetic energy move out of the liquid into the vapor phase. Simultaneously, some molecules from the vapor phase strike the surface of the liquid and go inside and are retained there. These simultaneous processes give rise to a constant vapor pressure due to an equilibrium in which the number of molecules leaving the liquid surface is equal to the number of molecules entering it. That is, the rate of vaporization is equal to the rate of condensation. It may be represented as H2O liquid giving H2O vapor in a reversible reaction. At this stage, the system is said to be in equilibrium. The double half arrows show that the processes in both the directions are going on simultaneously. The mixture of reactants and products in the equilibrium state is called an equilibrium mixture. However, this equilibrium is not static, but dynamic, as there is a lot of activity going on at the interface, but the amount of liquid and vapor now remains constant. The equilibrium concept that we have seen in physical processes can be applied to a chemical reaction as well. At a particular temperature, when the reactants react to give products, the concentration of reactants will keep decreasing, while that of the product will keep increasing. But after some time, the concentration of the reactants and the products become constant. This does not mean the reaction has stopped. Rather, it is because the rates of forward reaction and backward reaction have become equal, that is, it has achieved a state of dynamic equilibrium. Depending on the extent to which the chemical reactions proceed, the state of chemical equilibrium can be of three types. The reactions proceed nearly to completion, and negligible quantity of reactants is left. The reactions in which very small amounts of products are formed and most of the reactants are left unchanged at equilibrium. The reactions in which the concentrations of the reactants and products are comparable at the equilibrium stage. Various experimental conditions such as concentrations of reactants, temperature, pressure, etc. determine the extent to which the reactions proceed when equilibrium occurs. The optimization of these operational conditions is a very important concept for achieving higher yield of products in laboratories and industries. We know that chemical equilibrium between the oxygen O2 molecule and hemoglobin is very crucial in the transport and delivery of oxygen O2 from our lungs to our A similar equilibrium involving carbon monoxide and hemoglobin is responsible for the toxicity of the carbon monoxide molecule. Carbon monoxide stops oxygen and hemoglobin from achieving equilibria. Similarly, a liquid in a closed container reaches equilibrium with its vapors. It is a dynamic equilibrium and the rates of evaporation and condensation are equal at equilibrium. Equilibrium can be established for both physical and chemical processes. The transportation of oxygen in the muscles represents a chemical equilibrium, while a liquid in a closed container is an example of a physical equilibrium. The extent of processes in equilibrium varies with experimental conditions such as temperature, pressure and concentration of reactants, etc. For example, yield of ammonia increases with low temperature and high pressure. The optimization of operational conditions is very important in industry and in the laboratory so that equilibrium is favorable to the development of desired products. 
Equilibrium involving ions in aqueous solution is called ionic equilibrium. Reactions of acids, alkalis and salts fall into this category. The study of phase transformation processes such as solid to liquid and vice versa or liquid to gas and vice versa help in understanding the characteristics of a system at equilibrium. Let us see one system of solid, liquid, equilibrium. Ice and water kept in a perfectly insulated flask at 273 Kelvin and one atmospheric pressure are in the state of equilibrium. This equilibrium is dynamic. Molecules from liquid water adhere to ice and some molecules of ice escape into the liquid phase. Both these opposing processes occur simultaneously. Also, at this stage, there is no change of mass of ice and water as the rates of transfer of molecules from ice into water and of the reverse are equal at 273 Kelvin and 1 atmospheric pressure. For any pure substance at atmospheric pressure, the temperature at which the solid and liquid phases are at equilibrium is called the normal melting point or normal freezing point of the substance. For water, the normal freezing point is 273 Kelvin. The same kind of dynamic equilibrium is established between water and its vapors when some water is placed in a closed and perfectly dehydrated container. We can see in the manometer that initially pressure increases slowly inside the box and finally attains a constant value. Because initially there was no water vapor inside the box, as water evaporated, pressure inside the box increased owing to the addition of a water molecule into the gaseous phase. However, the rate of increase in pressure decreases with time owing to the condensation of vapor into water. Finally, it leads to equilibrium, where the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation and the pressure becomes constant. But it is a dynamic equilibrium and molecules keep on moving between liquid and vapor phase. This equilibrium gives rise to a constant vapor pressure called the vapor pressure of water. It increases with temperature. It is observed that different liquids such as ethanol, ethylene glycol and ether have different vapor pressures at the same temperature. The liquid with higher vapor pressure is more volatile and has a lower boiling point. For any pure liquid at one atmospheric pressure, the temperature at which the liquid and vapors are at equilibrium is called the normal boiling point of the liquid. For water, it is 100 degrees Celsius. It is important to note that the boiling point of a liquid depends on the atmospheric pressure and altitude of the place as well. At high pressure, the boiling point increases. We know that in water kept in an open atmosphere, the process of evaporation is faster than that of condensation. The vapors do not remain confined to a limited area, but are mixed with air. That's why it is not possible to reach equilibrium in an open system. Let us see an example of solid vapor equilibrium. If solid iodine is placed in a closed vessel, after some time the vessel is filled up with violet vapor and the intensity of color increases with time. After a certain time equilibrium is attained and the intensity of color becomes constant. Hence, solid iodine sublimes to give iodine vapor and iodine vapor condenses to give solid iodine. This kind of equilibrium is also found in camphor and ammonium chloride. We know that if we make a thick sugar syrup solution at higher temperatures, sugar crystals separate out if we cool the syrup to room temperature. It is a saturated solution and no more solute can be dissolved in it at a given temperature. In a saturated solution, a dynamic equilibrium exists between the solute molecules in the solid state and in the solution. Also, the rate of dissolution is equal to the rate of crystallization at equilibrium. 
This equality has been tested by adding radioactive sugar to the saturated solution of non-radioactive sugar. Due to exchange between radioactive and non-radioactive sugar in both phases, radioactivity is observed in both the solution and solid sugar. Notice that when a soda bottle is opened, some of the dissolved carbon dioxide fizzes out, owing to the difference of solubility of carbon dioxide at different pressures. At this stage, there is equilibrium between the concentration of carbon dioxide molecules in the gaseous state and in solution. It is governed by Henry's law. As per Henry's law, the mass of a gas dissolved in a given mass of a state at any temperature is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas above the solvent. Actually, a soda water bottle is sealed under pressure of gas when its solubility in water is high. As soon as the bottle is opened, the partial pressure of the gas in the atmosphere is reduced and some of the dissolved gas escapes to reach a new equilibrium as per reduced gas pressure. We know that in physical processes, equilibrium is possible only in a closed system at a given temperature. Both the opposing processes occur at the same rate and there is a dynamic but stable condition. Equilibrium in physical processes is characterized by the constant value of one of its parameters such as pressure, melting point, concentration of solute in solution. It's interesting to note that the magnitude of such quantities indicates the extent to which the process has proceeded before reaching equilibrium. can also attain a state of equilibrium. As these reactions occur in both forward and backward directions, when these forward and backward rates become equal, the concentration of the reactants and the products remain constant. This equilibrium state is dynamic as both the forward and backward reactions are happening simultaneously. Let us consider a general reversible reaction. A and B react reversibly to give C and D. Initially, we start with the reactants A and B. With the passage of time, there is an accumulation of the products C and D and a depletion of the reactants A and B. So, the rate of forward reaction decreases and the rate of reverse reaction increases. Eventually, a state of equilibrium is achieved when the two rates become equal. This equilibrium state can also be reached if we start with only C and D, with none of the reactants A and B present from the beginning. So the equilibrium can be reached from either direction. Let us understand this dynamic nature of a chemical equilibrium with the help of the example of production of ammonia through Haber's process. Let us take known amounts of dihydrogen and dinitrogen at high temperature and pressure. Let us also keep a check on the amount of ammonia formed and the amounts of unreacted dihydrogen and dinitrogen left. You can see from the graph that after a certain time, even though the reactants are still present, the concentration of the product, and hence the mixture, remains constant. This indicates that equilibrium state has been achieved. Let us repeat the experiment taking deuterium, D2, instead of hydrogen, H2. We see that the reaction mixture reaches equilibrium at the exact same composition, the only difference being that D2 and ND3 are present instead of H2 and NH3. When both these experiments reach equilibrium, the two equilibrium mixtures, H2, N2, NH3 and D2, N2, ND3 are mixed together and left for a while. Analyzing this mixture, we find that the concentration of ammonia has not changed, 
but on mass spectrographic analysis we find that ammonia and all its deuterated forms NH3, NH2D, NHD2, ND3 and dihydrogen and all its deuterated forms H2, HD, D2 are present. From this result we can conclude that forward and reverse reactions must also be going on in the mixture because if the reactions had stopped during equilibrium these deuterated compounds would not have formed. This is a clear indication of the fact that chemical reactions reach a state of dynamic equilibrium in which the rates of forward and reverse reactions are equal and there is no net change in composition. The equilibrium state can be achieved from both sides either if we start from dihydrogen and dinitrogen and get ammonia or if we start from ammonia and let it decompose to form dihydrogen and dinitrogen. Let us see this with another example. Consider the reaction. H2 plus I2 react reversibly giving 2HI. First, let us start with equal initial concentrations of H2 and I2. We see that the reaction proceeds in the forward direction and the concentration of HI increases while the concentration of H2 and I2 decreases till they become constant at equilibrium. Now let us start with HI and make the reaction proceed in the reverse direction. As you can see, the concentration of HI decreases while that of H2 and I2 increases till they become constant at equilibrium. We conclude that if the total number of hydrogen and iodine atoms are the same in a given volume, we get the same equilibrium mixture whether we start the reaction with pure reactants or with the pure product.